what about the person who's a poor sleeper, wakes up several times at night? How do you pick that one out? Double whammy. You got nocturia and you've got insomnia. And uh, it, it's, it's a little tricky, but one of the ways that we do it, first of all, the patients who are poor sleepers, they kind of know it. They tell you who they are. Um, so now, do you give sleeping pills, for example? Sleeping pills work great for nocturia. I never use them. Why? They're addictive. It's just not the type, the class of drug that I feel comfortable using for, you know, to treat insomnia. Um, if, if patients are not, you know, if they have abnormal sleep architecture and they, they just like to stay up at night and read or watch television or do something stimulating, that's not going to work. They're not going to get to sleep. So how do you fix them? You, you, you talk to them. You tell them you're upside down with regard to your life. Now, of course, it's hard to fix someone who's a shift worker. Uh, you, you can't fix that one. That's about 2% of the population. That's not typical. So if, if the first, way is to, first thing you have to do is diagnose it properly. So what I do is on my diary, the lower urinary tract uh, symptom score, we have an urge perception grade for each void, each void. So if the urge perception grade for most of the nocturic voids is zero, that means that they were not awakened by the desire to pass urine. That's a sleep disturbance. And of course, I'm going to maybe send them to someone who knows something about sleep, which these days, there's lots of doctors that practice sleep medicine, and they tend to be pulmonologists nowadays, and sometimes they can get polysomnography and sleep studies to see if they have abnormal polysomnograms. Um, in terms of practical advice, a little exercise at night is, I think, helpful. Doing whatever it takes to make them really tired at night, for example, reading a book, just read and then drift off to sleep. Now, if they have a prolonged sleep latency, and if they have easy awakening, that may be a, a little bit above the pay grade of a urologist, and that requires intervention by sleep specialists. Uh, and typically, they're going to give, you know, anxiolytics and and uh, uh, sleeping pills, basically. And anybody can do that, but I don't like it as a treatment for for anybody, frankly. So when does DDAVP come in? Well. That's a very good question. Um, DDAVP, um, if, if you're a, a pharma company, it's uh, basically treatment for anyone with nocturia. But the reality is, it's for someone who has nocturia in the absence of an underlying medical condition that's contributing to it. So all these conditions that we talked about, heart failure, sleep apnea, um, you know, anything causing peripheral edema, um, certain medications, all of that should be addressed first. About, well, we've actually done a study. Uh, the minimum number of patients who have nocturia, who have, as a chief complaint, or at least LUTs, who have uh, what we call the nocturnal polyuria syndrome, which is the ideal patient to receive desmopressin, it's somewhere between 17 and 40% depending upon whether you include hypertension in the numbers and what definition of nocturnal polyuria you use. The, the less so why, does, why does the penetration of this drug is so low, almost only 5% by some accounts? Right. Is that That's because urologists are afraid to use it in adults? I think it's less fear than the obligation that one has to spend a lot of time on that patient because you need to know their baseline sodium. You need to reach, uh, if they're over the age of 65, which so many of our patients are, there's a recommendation to obtain a serum sodium uh, within the first week of starting the medication or a dose increment, and then follow up sodiums thereafter. So I think there's a concern, particularly on the part of urologists, that they don't necessarily have the bandwidth or the, you know, the office capability to follow patients so closely to worry about their sodium. Is the spray any better than the pill in that regard? Identical. 
any new innovations in that regard that's coming that would lessen that issue, uh, particularly with the electrolyzed with sodium? There's research that is ongoing with new chemicals that are anti-diuretics. Um, and I think that, uh, that the, the approved versions of desmopressin, which would be the intraoral uh, lyophilizate uh, dissolving medication that, uh, and, and also the spray, they are probably about the same in terms of their bioavailability and so low that the incidence of hyponatremia is actually quite low. So if you select your patients carefully, then you don't have to worry nearly as much about hyponatremia. And who are those patients that you don't have to worry about? Well, ones certainly right off the bat that have normal baseline serum sodium, normal renal function. If you have normal renal function, it's gonna be hard, you're hard pressed to uh, accumulate desipressin to the extent that it'll cause hyponatremia. Uh, so renal function, age, and gender, or I should say sex, women are more sensitive than men, which is why there is actually a gender differential in terms of dosing, at least for Nocturna, which is the intraoral medication. Um, there is no gender distinction in dosing with Noctiva, which is the, uh, the nasal spray. And that's just the way that the studies were done. So women were found to be more sensitive to the desipressin melt than men. And we know that, that females, at least you know, in laboratory studies, using a murine model, that uh, female mice are about 2.7 times more sensitive to desipressin. And that's felt to be due to uh, the fact that the V2 receptor seems to be encoded on the X chromosome so that there's this, uh, this phenomenon of X escape that uh, women are, are more resistant to. So they can actually get away with a much lower dose, 25 micrograms, than the male dose, which is 50 micrograms uh, sublingual. Is there anything else you'd like to add to the readers? Well, I, for me, right now, the most exciting area in nocturia research is the nexus between nocturia as a symptom and cardiovascular disease. And it may turn out that nocturia is actually a symptom of hypertension. So we tend to think of hypertension, which is obviously a very serious condition, as being the silent killer. But it may be that many individuals have nocturia due to pressure natriuresis, due to failure of blood pressure to dip normally at night. So this non-dipping hypertension is an intriguing phenomenon that we've known about for long, for a long uh, period of time, but haven't really studied it so well. Um, the other thing that's of interest to me, and this is actually be the focus of a, a PhD dissertation, which I'll be defending in two weeks, um, is that what we found in terms of responders in, in any form to nocturia is that the patients who do not have nocturnal polyuria, whose nocturia improved, they did not improve because their, their small bladders got bigger. As you well know, Dr. Badlani, from many years of practice, it's, it's virtually impossible to give a medication which increases volume per void. We have great medications for urgency, but not for voided volumes. So it turns out, that patients who improve their nocturia who do not have nocturnal polyuria, they got better because their nocturnal urine volume went down despite the fact that it was normal to begin with. Those patients who responded clearly had mostly behavioral modification causing their normal nocturnal urine output to go further down, but also leads, leads me to conclude that those patients might very well be treated with an antidiuretic, which currently is indicated for nocturnal polyuria. So it may be that desmopressin could be indicated for small bladders. And this is something that definitely deserves further consideration from a research standpoint.